So for this portion of the lecture, we're going to be talking about something called feature nets. And feature nets are kind of like the original neural networks and basis for artificial intelligence that everybody is going on and on about these days. These are some of the earliest instantiations of that type of thinking and processing. And we're going to use this to understand or at least theorize about how the brain is recognizing words and how those various different contexts that we talked about in the previous lecture, like the word superiority effect or frequency biases, show up when we're recognizing words. So, like I kind of gave away just there, how does the brain do all that cool stuff that we were talking about in the last part of this lecture? I mean, how is it that we can recognize more frequent words than infrequent words? Why does priming make a difference? Why can we recognize E when it is presented in leif and dare better than when it is just E? And why do we make specific types of mistakes, but rarely the opposite? And one way to figure this out, because we can't just open people's heads and look inside and somehow see what's going on, well, at least in any meaningful way, we often have to use approximations to theorize how this works. And one of the ways in which we do this is through the use of something called feature net. Even though we use more advanced forms in today's world, this is kind of how it all started. Now, a couple of things to note before we really get into it. First of all, these are artificial approximations, right? They're not actually real somewhere in the world other than most likely instantiated on a computer. And they allow us to test or generate certain theories or ideas in a way that we couldn't do in a biological way. We cannot modify the connections that exist inside a brain to see what will happen. One, our technology isn't as good as to be able to do it on singular neurons or even clusters of neurons. And two, it would be wildly unethical. It's problematic enough that we do this to various other animals. Okay, they're instantiated oftentimes in a computer and the way in which we operate them is through the rules basically of matrix algebra. More complex ones use some forms of calculus as well, but a lot of it ultimately stems from matrix algebra. And if you there, if you would ever like to know more about the math or to become well, well versed in this type of operation, spending some time learning matrix algebra will suit you well. We also model them on some basic concepts of how the brain works. I'll cover this on the next slide. Now, an advantage of these networks is that they allow us to explore functions without the need for an executive controller. And this is probably one of the main reasons we use this. And let's just talk a minute about what this is. So an executive controller is some process, let's say, that directs all other processes. The executive controller is like the boss, the boss that's aware of all the goings on in the current system and can direct the system based on either inconsistencies or errors, or even just doling out good jobs and gold stars. But at the end of the day, the executive controller is the core hub that knows and directs the rest of the system. Now, this is analogous to the idea of a homunculus in a human. The concept of a homunculus, or when one is talking about the homuncular fallacy, is the idea that somewhere within us is a little us who is pulling levers and pushing buttons and thus directing our actions. Many of us have this subjective experience of an internal I. There is a, a core me within me who controls my body. And this has led to tons and tons of very fascinating debates in philosophy that have spanned hundreds of years now of this duality between the mind and the body. And the idea that there is some special characteristic of the mind that is able to generate and direct our then thoughts and bodily actions. More and more evidence has accrued over the last hundred years, let's say, of the difficulty of that being possible for a multitude of reasons. We won't really get into how the integration of mind and body is much more well unified than many of us have subjective experience of, but speaking just of the homunculus, it leads to a very interesting fallacy. If in my head was a little Reza 
who is controlling this outer body's functions, then that might work. But what is then controlling the little reza that sits within my head? Is there another smaller reza that sits inside the little reza who drives this reza that is talking for this lecture? And if so, what drives that smaller reza? Is there a tiny reza within the smaller reza within the little reza within this one? And you could just keep going back. But ultimately, you couldn't make it any smaller because we'd end up on the scale of singular atoms or even subatomic particles. And you can't make a reza out of one atom. It just doesn't make any sense. Therefore, it, in a logical way, is inconsistent that there is one little control system that directs the entirety of my being. If you'd ever like to get into it, a lot of evidence points towards the idea that we as a singular being exist and function in the world. There is no actual controller, which is scary for many people to think about because it is a little bit of a, a throwing of a glove in the face of a lot of will and law and structural arrangements of society, which a lot of people don't want to reevaluate. So let's get into some of the basic workings and assumptions of feature nets that we're going to talk about for the rest of this part of the lecture. So whenever you see little circles and ovals, these are referred to as units or nodes. These exist only when we draw diagrams of them. In the actual instantiation, they are just a little number within a matrix of numbers. A matrix of numbers is just a two-dimensional grid of numbers. It's kind of like if you randomly filled out a bunch of numbers in an Excel spreadsheet and it looked roughly rectangular, that would be a matrix of numbers. Nodes are connected to one another with arrows. Oftentimes, these arrows have a direction. These arrows are referred to as weights, and they represent the connections between these different nodes. Now, the direction of arrows corresponds to the direction of information flow. In almost all feature nets, the direction of flow is unidirectional. It will flow in one direction through the network. In more modern networks, this is not the case. We have bidirectional informational flow. Some even more complex networks have multiple types of information flow throughout different parts of the network itself. For right now, it is a safe assumption for the rest of this portion of the lecture that activation flow will always go from the smallest units up to the final units, which will be features to words. Now, each node has an activation threshold. And if this activation threshold is met, it will then pass activation onwards to the other nodes that it is connected to. If it receives activation, but that activation does not cross this threshold, it will not pass activation on to the nodes to which it's connected. This is analogous to the idea of the activation threshold of a neuron. If a neuron does not reach threshold, it will not fire. This is one of the reasons why we talk about these things as biologically plausible, that they're built on the assumptions of the way the brain works, even though they do not work exactly like the brain. Okay. Nodes can receive varying amounts of activation from either one or multiple other nodes. Right? It could be that one node receives a large amount of activation from one node or a small amount of activation from one node. It could be that one node receives a small amount of activation from five different nodes or it could be that one node receives a large amount of activation from three different nodes. Right? It can be multiple different combinations and gradations of how much activation is passed on. This is analogous to the chemical transmission between neurons. It is also similar to the firing rates of neurons as well. Now, a neuron can fire rapidly and release large amounts of neurotransmitters, or it could fire slowly and release smaller amounts of neurotransmitters. A neuron could have connections to multiple neurons or only to a few neurons. This is what we mean by a node can be connected to multiple different nodes and it can receive varying degrees of activation from these nodes. Further, not all nodes have the same activation threshold. Some nodes will fire more easily 
they need not receive as much activation in order to pass on activation down through the network, while others will need to receive a significant or large portion of activation before they are ready to pass on activation. Nodes have baseline activation. This just means that a node will not just stay at zero. Oftentimes nodes are set to have some resting level of activation. For example, let's say you wanted to give it a 0.2 value out of the possible zero to one. This allows a node to be suppressed. You can lower its activation even further, and then of course, rise it past baseline. This is analogous to the resting firing rate of a neuron. When a neuron is not active, it is not that it doesn't fire at all. Most neurons in the brain, when they're doing nothing, will still fire every so often. This is their basal firing rate or resting firing rate. Finally, nodes, when no longer receiving activation, will not return to baseline immediately. It is not an instantaneous event where activation is now stopped and they've snapped back to baseline. They will do so slowly they will slowly decrease. A way to imagine this would be you have a hot cup of coffee that you put in a room and it doesn't immediately become room temperature. It takes a while for it to return to room temperature. Of course, if it continues to receive activation, it will not return to baseline, even though it could be that it does settle at a lower value. Using this cup of hot coffee analogy, so if I make piping hot fresh coffee with boiling water and then I put a little heater underneath it so that it always keeps it warm enough where it's enjoyable to drink, but never gets cold. I'm giving it less activation than I originally did when I boiled the water, but I'm giving it enough to keep it from going all the way back to baseline. A few more notes before we actually get into the meat of the feature notes. So one assumption that we make all the time or that you will hear a lot is that these networks are biologically plausible or that they work in a biologically plausible manner. We say this because we have built these networks to have properties modeled off of neurons. As you saw, base activation rates, baselines of activation, the interconnections of the nodes, and the way that they're able to pass activation to and from each other. And it's analogous to how neurons operate. Please do not get caught in the assumption of one node represents one neuron. That is not the case. Right? It just is not the case because we're going to talk about feature nets that have several dozen nodes. There's probably no function in the brain that is handled by only a few dozen neurons. We wouldn't need 86 billion otherwise. Also, one node doesn't really represent a cluster of neurons either. It isn't a one-to-one -one matching. If you had to think of a brain circuit comparison to a feature net, at best you could say that one node corresponds to a complex series of neural circuits all involved in a specific, in a specific process, but even then we generally don't think of it in this manner. Largely we're just thinking about it as how can we get a network without a central controller to operate in smart or biologically equivalent manners. By that, I just mean in manners we see in the world that is conducted by life. Another limitation or thing to remember is that all of these nodes, their activation levels, their connections, the way they transfer activation, their baselines, all of this is represented mathematically. Right? This is all done through matrix algebra, matrices and transformations of matrices. Right? There are no actual nodes anywhere. It is all matrix algebra, which is very much like actual algebra that you were taught in high school, except instead of using single values for X's and Y's, you use entire matrices. It allows you to operate on huge amounts of data simultaneously, as opposed to finding hundreds of X's and Y's. We draw the diagrams for understanding. They're not actually represented in that manner other than theoretically with the connections. Right? Further, the math that we use to instantiate these networks, especially some of the newer networks, whenever we talk about networks that can learn, 
we're using a modified form of calculus in order to have it learn, that math works on a fundamentally different principle than the way our brain seems to operate. All of these networks require computer memory in which we can store sets and stages of its process. The brain doesn't have those type of memory storage units. So even though we can make some of these more complicated, newer, amazing networks do all kinds of crazy things that for a long time were thought to be just the purview of human beings, the networks are doing it in a fundamentally different way, even though they're modeled on us or just brains in general. So just stuff to be aware of. Okay. So let me turn on the clicky thing again and all right. Okay. So let's get into this. So here is a basic feature net. So we'll start with this line here. This line is made up of feature detectors. And as you can see, these are the most basic features. There are little curves at different orientations. There are lines at different angles. And of course, we're only showing you here, for example, the three different curves you would need to assemble into a C, right? This one is the back, this one is the top, and this one is the bottom. Of course, there are all kinds of other connectors too, they're just not shown here for simplicity because it would become really long. It's just a matter of activation. These are the only three that were activated. You wouldn't activate a vertical line for a C. There'd be no need. It's not present. Same thing here. There are two little lines. This can be joined into an L, right? And it goes on and on and on. And these little ellipses here are just representing that they are a continuing degree of feature detectors in this line. What's important is this line is just representing these base features. The next layer in our feature net is the letter detectors, and these consist of individual letters, much the same way that these operate. They get activation from the various feature detectors. So the more I'm seeing these shapes in the world outside my eyes, the more likely I'm registering a C because these combined together in a specific way will give me a C. So too, as the different letters receive activation, that I will get the word clock. Now, again, we're doing this for simplicity. Technically, all letters could be represented here. They would just have different degrees of activation, just like all words could be represented here. And based on the manner in which they are, you will get different words. And please be aware that we are completely ignoring relationship in space for these examples. Right? That just makes it easier because we don't have to deal with how do we know that C comes before L. We're just assuming that that's how the system works. Right? And remember, we get to do things like that because these are just systems that allow us to test fundamental assumptions. We don't actually have to say, how is every single neuron working? Okay, so all of these are little nodes. right? These are all the connections between nodes. Notice the arrows. So information flows from the features to the letters to the word detectors. These features, if you wanted, you can imagine little arrows coming up and you would just write stimulus underneath that the world outside is giving these activation, which are passing it forward. In reality, there is no world. You as the experimenter or computer scientist, as whatever the case may be, which is getting more and more crossed in cognitive science actually, but anyway, you will provide activation in a hypothetical way, assuming that this is what the organism is looking at. Okay, so how do we see clock? How do we get the word clock? Well, we're looking at the word clock on a screen. And remember when we said, when we're recognizing, we're decomposing it into its fundamental features, which we will assemble back up. So we're aware of these little features, these curves of different shapes and sizes, and these, well, I guess they're all the same technical shape, just different orientations, and different lines, which are then combined into letters. And then these letters are combined into a word. And then we are aware of the word clock, because technically you could imagine, remember from the what and where pathway we talked about, this would be tied to the concept of what in the what pathway of the temporal cortex. Right? And then we'd be like, clock. A person with associative agnosia has a problem here. 
they cannot join all of these features into the semantic knowledge of what it is. They could be looking at a clock and say it's a round thing, it seems to have these weird symbolic things on it, it has these little pointy things that are turning, but they won't be able to say clock. Hmm? Okay, hopefully that at least makes some sense. Uh, if not, just rewind and go over this again. And if you don't feel like doing that, we're going to talk about a whole series of these right now. So let's use this to explain frequency effects. How is it that we can recognize frequency or high frequency words at a higher rate than low frequency words? Well, let's figure this out. So imagine you're shown the word clock, which is a high frequency word for 30 milliseconds. All of your various feature detectors light up, at least the relevant ones for a little while, and they pass activation on to all of the various letters, which in turn pass it on to clock exactly like we had later. But wouldn't it be the same for quandary? Yeah, it would be. That's how the basic system works. But remember what I said. All of these only receive a tiny amount of activation because the stimulus is only present for 30 milliseconds. Now, remember when I was talking about the fundamental assumptions of certain types of nodes. Certain items, words, like clock, are high frequency words. We come across them a lot. The way this is represented is through a node that has a lower activation threshold than an infrequent word that would have a higher activation threshold. So if I'm saying that the word clock has a lower activation threshold than the word quandary, and forgive me for them not being equal in letters, but you can think of an unfamiliar word that's five letters long, if that makes it better. So I only have a limited amount of activation that flows through the network. And if this is a common word with a low activation threshold, I'm more likely to get activation passing on from this into my awareness being like, haha, it is a clock. Whereas if I receive only the same amount of activation which flows through the network and there's a weird word like quandary, then it has a much higher threshold. And thus, even though it receives the same amount of activation as clock, it doesn't fire onwards and I never become aware of it. I do not recognize it, even though some activation from technically sensing it was provided to my system, the system just could not recognize it because of those differences in activation thresholds for specific nodes in these networks. This is how it is at least thought in part how frequency effects are processed through the brain. And we can use these feature nets to theorize about how that could be. Now, remember, this system has no knowledge of what words are frequent and what are not. Rather, it only has some units in it that have low frequencies, I mean, low activation thresholds, and others that have higher activation thresholds. And that in itself is enough to explain frequency effects. And how, you might ask, do these thresholds change? Well, oftentimes, even seen in the brain, Neural clusters or circuits that are continually firing in certain patterns lead or need less and less activation to get the same firing. This is one of the reasons why it is believed that the more you practice something, the easier it gets. There comes a plain point after which you've been practicing enough where you barely even have to think about something. This is because you need far less neuronal activity and energy in order to accomplish that same task because you have done it so many times. When we talk about muscle memory, it is not actually stored in your muscles. It is stored in your brain. When something is encoded into our quote unquote muscle memory, what we mean is that it has been encoded in the brain to such an extent that I am no longer actively required to pay attention to that task or behavior. It has become easy and most of the required circuits have very low activation thresholds when fired in that sequence. Okay, well, what about recency? Well, we can use the same type of logic. Now, well, a little bit different, I guess. So same thing again, right? We have 30 milliseconds of activity, so a little bit of activation is flowing and goes up to the letters, and let's say that the letters pass it on to the word, 
And let's assume this time that it's not enough to get clock to light up and pass on its activation, right? It's just too little. What happens when I have seen clock just a little while ago, though? Remember I said that once a neuron, or not a neuron, excuse me, a node or unit has fired, it doesn't immediately return to baseline, right? It's like that hot cup of coffee that slowly cools down. It takes time. So if I've just seen the word clock a few minutes ago, it is still warmed up, so to speak, just like that cup of coffee. So it does not need as much activation to push it past its activation threshold. So when I'm primed with something, ultimately what I'm doing is warming up or lighting up all of the neural circuits that are involved in whatever that task was. This is why we, again, practice things so that when we actually have to do something, we're aware of it, right? This is one of the fundamental reasons why when you're learning math, people are like, you got to practice and practice and practice and practice. You're doing both of these things. You're one, priming your system to be able to think and operate like you're required to do in an exam. And two, the more and more you do it, the less energy in your mind you actually have to devote to those processes. So back to this example, because I just saw clock a few minutes ago, this unit is still on its way slowly coming down to baseline. And then when I'm shown the word, again, for a small amount of time, a small amount of activation lights up these feature detectors, which pass their activation to the letter detectors, which pass it on to this word detector. And because it was not, even though it was not enough originally to push it from baseline over the threshold, it is enough, however, to push it from some place above baseline over its threshold. And thus, we are more likely to recognize words we have been primed with recently than words we have not been primed with. Oh man, I really wish I could see the whole class to see whether this was landing or not. Well, if not, I guess it is recorded, so you can go over this a couple of times or read the textbook. Okay, let's get into well-formedness. Now, here we have to add a little bit of information to our feature detector, which again, we're able to do because remember, these are assumptions and theory building models, right? We are allowed to play with them flexibly because that's what they're used for. So in order to explain well-formedness, which just remember that this is in regard to what words are more well formed, which is we're saying that they're made up of more statistically common pairings of letters, right? Remember how we were saying that certain words in dare or pairings of letters in dare are more common than, what was it? Uh, Leif, which has more common pairings than subne, which is the SBNE. So we add an extra layer between our letter detectors and our word. So we still have our feature detectors. They work exactly the same. They're connected to our letter detectors, which work exactly the same. But instead of passing activation to the word, excuse me, they pass activation to what we call bigram detectors. And this is just bi as in two, gram as in some type of thing, I'm assuming at least, and then their detectors. So here, basically, we're just combining the pairs of letters together, right? In this case, we have CL and LO and you could say that there was an OC here and then the CK. Probably just did that to make this nice pyramid shape. Anyhow, all of these bigram detectors then in turn are lit up by the letters and pass on activation to the word. So even though this looks more complicated, it works in exactly the same way as the previous three we talked about just now. Okay, so how do we explain well formedness well it is again related to activation thresholds right certain pairings of letters are more common remember i said if you wanted to determine well formedness you would go out and you would look at what are all the potential combinations of letters that you see in the world corrected for frequency and the ones that are the most common the ones we're most exposed to are the most well formed and remember how i was talking on the last one the more and more you see something, 
the more your neuronal system gets used to it and the less energy required to instantiate that chain of events. So the more I see certain letter pairings, the more readily those units or neural clusters will fire. Another way of talking about this is the more I see them, the lower the activation thresholds for those units is going to be. Thus, when I'm recognizing certain types of words, words that are made up of more statistically common items are easier to recognize. The reason that they're easy to recognize is because the bigram detectors will be requiring a lower degree of activation for common ones than for uncommon ones. So using the same analogy as before, since these are only receiving such a little amount of information, it is not enough just to activate all of these bigram detectors, evenly at least, but rather that small amount of activation will flow up and those bigram detectors that are very commonly seen that have low activation thresholds are more likely to fire than those that don't, that you don't see often, like SB. It is a very uncommon letter pairing. The bigram detector for SB will have a relatively high activation threshold because it's almost never used. And this determines ultimately how we have improved recognition based on well-formedness as opposed to words that are made up of statistically uncommon pairings of letters. All right, let's move on to talking a little bit about confusion. All right, so this is a very similar network. In this case, we're gonna talk about corn now instead of clocks. And this is essentially a similar network to the one we just saw on the previous page with our bigram detectors, except here they're actually showing you the word that is being presented, right? So the C is these shapes here, and the O is only this under part, which we're gonna talk about in a second. The R goes onwards. These are not lit up, even though they were supposed to be of the O. And the reason, well, before that, the feature detectors are connected to the letter detectors, which are connected to the bigram detectors, which are then connected to the word detector. Now, let's imagine that you're in this task and you see the C and you see the R and you see the N in that 30 milliseconds that it was flashed on the screen to you, but you only saw the under curve of the O, that's all. You didn't see the whole letter. So there's some confusion now because that under curve could be part of several letters. It could be an O that has an under curve. It could be a U that also has the under curve. By under curve, I just mean a curve like this, this shape right here. It could also be a Q, right? A Q has that same under curve and it could be an S, right? That also has this under curve. So what is it? You know that there's a C, a space and an R and an N, and it could be corn with an O. It could be kern with a U, if that's how you would say it. And I'm not even gonna try and say how you would say that word if it was a Q or an S, right? Very difficult. Okay, so what happened? Some activation goes into these feature detectors from the stimulus itself. Now, these feature detectors, the first two that are seeing C, are happily lighting up C. And we can assume that the ones for R and N are doing the same thing. Now, we're a little bit stuck when we get to O. But remember how these feature detectors don't care what the actual letters are. They're just recognizing features and passing it on to all relevant letters that have those features, right? So when this little upside down U-shaped thing is activated by the partial view we got of O, it is passing a small amount of activation to O, the same amount to U, the same amount to Q, and the same amount to S, right? This is what we mean by confusion. The system doesn't know what is the letter, even though it has some of the information, right? It could be any of those four letters. So all four of these letters in turn get some activation from this shape and they pass it on into the bigram detectors that are joined with C. So now I'm getting a ton of activation from C, right? Which is giving activation to the CO bigram detector, the CU bigram detector, the CQ bigram detector, and the CS bigram detector. And each of these is also receiving a little bit of activation from the O, 
U, Q, and S. So now, if you were to calculate this out, the CO, CU, CQ, and CS biogram detectors are all receiving the same amount of activation, right? The same amount fundamentally, if you trace out the arrows, is arriving at these biogram detectors. But now remember in the last network when we were talking about well-formedness, not all biogram detectors have the same activation thresholds. The ones we see more commonly will have lower activation thresholds than the ones that are uncommon, right? So in this case, CO is the most common letter pairing you're gonna see out of these potential ones. COs are more common in words than CUs, which are more common than CQs, which rarely happen, and are also more common than CS. Therefore, even though all of these are receiving the same amount of activation, the CO is likely to fire more readily because it has the lowest activation threshold. It does not need as much activation as the others in order to fire. And so, in this way, we are likely to still be able to interpret the word corn even though we didn't actually see the entirety of the letter O. And this is how these networks are able to resolve confusion. Pretty cool, right? Now, just a little thing to throw out there just in case, just to put thinking hats on. Um, I'm not sure if this is even a relevant thing anymore, but back when I was young, still living in Pakistan and in high school, a computer game called Counter-Strike was huge. People would sit in these stuffy little cafes with hundreds of computers and all put on headphones and all play a game that was basically terrorists versus counter-terrorists and they would just run around shooting each other with various types of guns and stuff. And a little too real for me personally, but people loved it. And it was called or abbreviated to CS. And so people who played Counter-Strike said CS a lot, right? Because you weren't cool if you said Counter-Strike, you were cool if you were like, let's go play some CS. For them, this biogram detector might have an incredibly low activation. And so for them, when they saw this ambiguous feature, if they had said CS enough, if they had seen it enough, maybe their CS biogram detector would have less activation threshold than CO. And perhaps then, they would respond to this as being an incorrect letter sequence. But that is just extra to think about. All right, let's continue these examples and this time talk about ambiguity. So we didn't talk about ambiguity when we were looking at the experiments around recognition around words. It's a lot of arounds in that sentence. But this goes back to when you were able to read the cat, which is presented here. And again, notice that the H and the A are ambiguous. They both are ultimately the same stimulus representation, but could be represented in either way, depending on the context that they're in. So while this feature detector or feature net does still say corn, which goes to corn, it works in a very similar process. So here you'll just have to use your imaginations to assume that you have basic features for these various different letters. And those are a vertical and a horizontal line, two diagonals and a horizontal, a vertical with some horizontals, some of those curves that we're familiar with right here. And again, the same kind of two diagonals with one horizontal and then a vertical and a horizontal again. Now, these are the ones we're interested in because these are ultimately ambiguous features. And so what's going to happen? We'll have our features that are presented as is, and we'll just assume that you only see this for a short amount of time in this case. And here again, the various letters are activated. So the T without problem, E also C, and then a T again. But now this symbol that looks sort of halfway between an A and an H shares features with both. It has somewhat of an H representation and another bit of the A. So the likelihood is you'll get feature detectors that are activating both the H letter and the A letter detectors, which will in turn pass information up into bigram detectors. And so let's examine this bigram detector first. Here I have bigram detectors for TA, 
and for TH. And both of them are ultimately receiving similar amounts of activation because T is strong and the A and the H both provide some weak activation to their respective bigram detectors. Now, as we've been talking about with frequency, TH is probably a much more common bigram than TA, even though TA exists as well. Now, here we can imagine that the TH bigram detector will win out and fire compared with the TA just because it does not occur as often. We see exactly the same process here between CA and CH. And you might be asking yourselves, well, there are a lot of things with CA, but CH is pretty much all over the place. So how can you tell us that this is not read as sh instead of cat? Well, I did look it up because I had that same thought and I'm projecting onto all of you that you had this same skeptical thought as I did, which maybe you did and maybe you didn't, but nonetheless, we know the answer now because I looked it up and it turns out there are a little bit more than 12,000 words that start with CA, while there are only about 9,000 words that start with CH. And while you could say, yes, but there may be many more cases of CH in the middle of words, and that would be true, but you will find, I don't know if we'll talk about it right now, but we are much more focused on the beginnings and endings of words than, well, especially the beginnings, than any part in the middle. So this is a good estimate by having numbers of words that start with a certain type of letter that give us some clues as to which bigram detector is likely to be the one that wins out. And in this case, the CA bigram detector being more commonly activated and thus having a lower threshold overall will tend to pass its activation onwards. And it is in this way that these feature detectors or feature networks are able to resolve ambiguity. And this is thought to be the mechanism by which you can look at this stimulus and without any trouble at all, read the cat. Pretty cool, right? Um, just a note, if you wanted to play around with this, about how it's more difficult for us to understand with letters in the middle versus in the beginning, just estimate to yourself whether it is, there are more words that start with the letter R, for example, or if there are more words that have R as the third letter. I'm not going to tell you the answer, but there is one. Okay, so we're going to jump back into this word corn, and let us now examine the word superiority effect. Now, remember, this is when we are better able to recognize the presence of a single letter when it is presented embedded in a word than when that word is, I mean, excuse me, that letter is presented by itself. So how does this work? Well, let's say, excuse me, you're trying to decide between O and Q. These are two letters that are close together. And let's say, again, this follows the same hypothetical logic where you saw this word corn flashed very quickly to you and you didn't see the O all you saw was the little underlying curve of this. Now, again, by that same process, the various feature detectors are activated. They activate in turn the letter detectors. Because of the underlying curve shape, you get activation for O, U, Q, and S, because all of them have this feature. They all activate the respective bigram detectors, C, O, C, U, C, Q, and C, S. Of course, C, O wins out because it's the most common high frequency bigram compared to these others. And so we see the word corn. And so when I'm now asked whether I recognize there being an O or a Q, because I know that the word is corn and corn has an O, I'm now likely to be able to quote unquote recognize that I had seen an O. Now, what would happen if there was only one letter? Now in your minds, just please erase C's and R's and N's from this and you have the O but all you saw in those 30 milliseconds was that under shape of it, and it will pass on activation to O, U, Q, and S, but it stops there because now we only have one letter, and now we have confusion because it could be an O, but it could also be a Q, and I no longer know what I saw because it could have been an S too, but no one asked me about S's, and 
this is in principle why we are able to recognize individual letters more accurately when they're presented in a word than when they're by themselves. But you might be asking yourself, okay, Reza, but how does that explain that funny word, Leif, that wasn't a real word, and even worse, Subni? Well, it rests in the bigram detectors once more, where you have certain bigram detectors that are more common and others that are not so common. Right? In the dare, leif, and subni example, you had dare, which is made up of multiple bigram detectors that are all commonly used. For leif, similar but not as common. And for the S, B, and E letter pairings, they were consisting of bigram detectors that are very rarely, if ever, used. And so those will tend to inhibit activation or at least require a large degree of activation in order to pass on their subsequent activation. Therefore, those do not help us as compared to just a single letter, which again fizzles out because it's passing activation to many, and none of them meet threshold. Whereas when there are words that sound sensical and are made up of bigrams that are high in frequency, even if they have no meaning, it is still those bigrams and the differences in activation thresholds for them that allows the improved recognition of individual letters even if you don't see the entire letter. I mean, you gotta admit, that's pretty cool. Well, I guess you don't have to admit. I mean, I can't stand in front of you all and just wiggle around until you get uncomfortable and are like, yes, it is cool. I mean, I don't really need you to tell me that. I hope you think this stuff is cool, because it's pretty cool. <laughs> okay. Finally, let us look at errors. How is it that errors happen. And remember when we talked about the specific type of errors with word recognition, we make errors in the direction of higher frequency words, but very rarely, if ever, in the direction of lower frequency words. Now, this again happens at the biogram detector level. So this time, instead of being presented with the word corn, we're presented with CQRN, which I'm not really sure how you'd even pronounce that. Again, let's imagine, you know, you just see the under part of this Q, not the whole thing, and you see the C, the R, and the N, you're now features that you're now familiar with activate with this little bit of activation for those 30 milliseconds, and they pass on their activation. Once more, the C, and of course the R and the N over here, get their activation strongly because you saw those letters. But now for that undershaped U looking piece, you again have activation for the O, the U, the Q, and the S, which pass them to their respective bigram detectors. And remember what happened when we were talking about confusion. The CO is most readily able to fire because of its lower activation threshold, while CU has a higher activation threshold and CQ even higher still. Now, because there was ambiguity, you don't know for sure that this Q was present, and so the CO, which receives as much activation as CQ, is more likely to fire and create the word corn as opposed to CQ firing and registering the actual word that's present. Now, here exactly the same system that allows us to reconcile confusion is what is leading to our errors in recognition. Furthermore, it explains why our errors happen in the direction of increased familiarity or regularity as opposed to the other direction. Because bigrams and bigram detectors that represent very frequently presented words and pairings require much less energy to be passed on forward, whereas unusual ones tend not to be. And words that are unusual or have strange letter pairings are the ones we tend to make mistakes on when we're only presented with them for a very short time. And we make those mistakes in the direction of words that are more familiar to us. This is why when TPUM, T-P-U-M was presented, people oftentimes thought of it as either TRUM, which sounds somewhat correct, those bigrams are of higher frequency, and sometimes even going as far as to convert it to DRUM because that has even more common bigrams within it, which are more readily able to fire. And this is ultimately why we believe that we see this pattern in our word recognition capabilities. Now, please remember, <clears throat> excuse me, of course, 
that this applies predominantly to the fact that these are shown to us for very brief amounts of time. If you were able to look at CQRN for a whole minute, or 10, let's say, you would not have this error. You could just look at it, examine it, and even commit it to memory. And so you would not struggle with it. This is only present in that immediate slice of time in which there is very little information for our recognition system to process the world. Now, while you might ask yourselves, well, who cares about that short amount of time? Almost nothing in the world exists at that time scale. Well, yes, that is true, but we are not able to really understand the mechanisms by which our recognition system works if we just allow people to look at stuff for as long as they choose, unless there is some severe neurological disorder. In this case, we can take healthy patients or participants and try and figure out and use their information to allow us to glean understanding of how the recognition system works. And then we can test models. As you have seen, we were able to look at a whole bunch of empirical data, create these artificial feature nets based on some existing theories and use them to explain many of the results that we saw in that previous lecture component. Okay, a little bit more information before we close out this lecture set. So distributed knowledge or representation is how we think that the brain manages most of its information. So before jumping into that, just consider this. If we're making the assumption that the brain works in this fashion, like how these feature nets are working, how does it know anything about statistical regularity or spelling? There's no unit inside that has told it that CO is more common than CU, which is more common than CQ. And how does it even know how spelling works, that these letters go together? Now, the answer is the system doesn't actually know, nor does our brain actually know. This information is encoded in those activation thresholds. It is the repeated use over time that slowly modulates the degree of connectivity and the activation thresholds of the parameters in that system. And over time, the entire system itself gets tuned to reflect the world in which that system is. It is this tuning of the system that is how that information is stored. There is no one centralized location in which that information is kept. This idea of information being across the entire network and only the whole network as a whole contains the information is the concept of distributed knowledge. The converse of this is uh, localized or yeah, localized representations or knowledge. And this just means that it would be stored in one place. So our brain doesn't actually have a little file cabinet somewhere where all our trivia pieces of knowledge are contained. Rather, our knowledge is contained across much of the entire brain, large parts of it being involved in every time we want to create or recall that knowledge. Just for example, if you are thinking about a person you care about deeply, yes, there are parts that are heavily involved in what we call memory, but as soon as you try and visualize them, what you are actually doing is recreating an image of that person using most of the visual cortex that you would use as if you were actually looking at them. And then if you think about something they said while you're imagining their face, you're also using a large part of your temporal cortex to not necessarily process, but recreate the experience through those processing systems in order to allow you to remember what they were saying. In this way, our memories are stored across the brain not in any one specific place. If you were thinking to yourself, yes, but what about HM who could no longer encode new memories? Remember, it's not that all the memories for HM were gone. Rather, the specific loss of function was the inability to encode new memories, the inability to be able to represent information across the entirety of the cortex in a way that allows for those new memories to be stored by tuning the entire neural network that is your brain. Now, please remember, this is probably a little bit of a weird concept, but 
only we see knowledge and governing rules, right? When we look at these networks, we're like, oh, okay, it's able to handle frequency and it knows about this because it can do it. Or if you look at me, you're like, oh, Reza kind of understands this stuff about frequency nets or sorry, feature nets. And therefore you think I have some little place in my brain where I have this information, but that's not how it works, right? It only looks like it when you look at the complete being that is me, or at least you listen to me through this lecture, right? Same thing with the network. No one part of the network knows that something is more common or less common than another. No one part of the network is like, yep, that was a no. There is no executive controller that is making those decisions. All of this knowledge is just the network itself. It is through the functions of the network that this knowledge manifests, right? It's no complex rules. It's just a matter of the flow of activation, timing, and repetition. And it is largely thought that this is how huge parts of our brain also function. A last note on mistakes. So a lot of people hate mistakes. They just are terrified of them. They think they're bad. They take all kinds of weird internal blame if they make a mistake. And well, there's a lot of baggage in society around. Them. So why have a system that makes mistakes? The first answer to this that's not listed here is because an engineer did not build a human being. A human being, I'm sorry about your beliefs, but as far as we know, to the best estimate, is the product of evolution. And evolution is not directed. It is in itself a system responding to the environment, right? It's not that there was supposed to be a two-legged or four-legged creature. It just so happened to be in the environment in which they were living, certain models survived better than other models, and so on and so forth. These have slightly changed over time. Now, that excludes the notion of building a perfect flawless system, if you could even do something like that, right? So. First of all, it's error prone because we're just products of life. We're not products of engineers who try and design things so that they don't have errors. And even things engineers build ultimately will have errors. Though some are unbelievable, right? Like the Voyager is still rocking out on its cosmos trip through space and it has been beaming back data for years, decades. But okay, more to the point. The reason for this is the result of compromise. There is an inverse relationship between accuracy in recognition and speed of recognition. You can, of course, as I've mentioned several times throughout this lecture, be very accurate if you can just stare at something for a little while. You would never mistake a word if you spent five minutes on every single word, but you would never be able to finish any of your reading assignments if you in fact took five minutes to look at every single word. Now, you could say to yourself, well, there were no words back in the evolutionary time where the Homo sapien came into being, so what the heck are you talking about? Well, let's look at a more real life example for our once upon a time ago ancestors. And probably way back before Homo sapiens too, because this system is probably present in many, but we can't test it because most things aren't as fluid with words as we are. But now, imagine yourself a once upon a time human somewhere in the savannah where we first really got our stride going. And you look over yonder and you think you see a line. And your bigram detectors are all going wee, except they're not bigrams, they're little shape detectors and color detectors and all of them working together to try and give you some complete object. Imagine in reality it's a stump, but you run away, right? In that case, at worst, you look a little silly. You're someone who ran away from a stump, a tree trunk thing sitting there. But imagine the converse. You're like, I'm not going to be a chump and I'm not going to have anybody laugh at me. So I'm going to examine this strange thing for the next 10 minutes to make sure it is or it is not a lion. In those 10 minutes that you're spending examining that thing, that lion is going to eat you. And all the people who spent time giving it 10 minutes of careful, careful thought didn't survive. The ones who ran away are the ones who are more likely to survive. Thus, there is always this compromise between accuracy and the speed of recognition. 
the fact that we are able to recognize so many things as accurately as we can in such little time is a testament to how amazing the system is. Asking for a system that is truly flawless is hubris and greedy. Finally, well, no, you could say other things. That's just my opinion. Okay, another bit is having a system that can deal with ambiguity will cost some degree of accuracy. If you were intolerant to ambiguity, it is possible that you could always be accurate. But then would be the problem of dealing with a world that itself is ambiguous. If you gave up the ability to deal with ambiguity for being ultra accurate, you would not be able to process a tremendous amount of information about the world because the world is full of ambiguous things, right? Just remember those weird unstable shapes we talked about last time, the Necker cube and so on and so forth. And we haven't even talked about how we actually understand the difference between foreground and background yet. So there's always a cost, always, to everything, right? Please remember, nothing is completely free, right? Not even that free lunch that people talk about. In fact, not even our will is completely free. And we can debate about that one day, but the evidence points more and more in that direction. 